Good morning. I'm uh, Lee Rainey, director of the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project, and I'm thrilled to be here with the um, technological equivalent of the 1927 New York Yankees. <laughs> um, this is a panel that's going to be talking a bit about research that we released this morning from the Pew Internet Project about the way that people use technology uh, as they form uh, groups, act in groups, get, have impact uh, in groups. And the, the panel consists of, um, of, of some in, incredibly impressive people. Clay Shirky is, um, it's hard to think of a point in history where uh, something, some major social or political or technological force was emerging and its, and its, and its major analyst was emerging with it. Clay covers the, the sort of most important elements of the impact of the Internet in real time, and I, we have not seen his like probably uh, in, in the history of, of social criticism and technological criticism. Andrew Keene is, uh, is, the, is, is the primary critic or warrior uh, about something that Clay has written about. Clay argues that we are breaking things faster than we are fixing them. Andrew is the great thinker about what we lose uh, in the process of breaking things. Alex Howard is the, um, uh, the Tocqueville, the, uh, the Drudge, the Huffington Post for Government 2.0. He's, he's, a, he's a force field in understanding the impact of, uh, of these technologies, particularly on the way citizens interact with government and government interacts with its citizens. And as far as I'm concerned, Jerry Berman is Zeus. He is the god of gods when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to thinking about uh, public policy and, and technology policy. So I'm honored to be with him. And I thought just for a quick minute I'd orient you to this research that we put out. There's a, there's a press release uh, about it on the table in the back, and I'm, I'm just going to give you a real quick data dump about what we're saying so that you will understand some of the things that we're talking about in this conversation. Uh, Jerry and David Johnson uh, from the Center for Democracy and Technology and later Tim Lorton uh, from, from the uh, Internet Education Foundation came to me about a year ago with a manifesto and on it listed the 21 things that people say is good about the Internet and the 21 things that people say is bad about the Internet. And it's all in the realm of sort of theological conversation about whether things are good or bad. And they were wondering if there actually could be some data introduced uh, into the subject. Uh, and we uh, went to school on a lot of the things that they were thinking about. And they coached us through and, and have produced this report that we're, we're putting out today. We asked people uh, about 27 different kinds of groups that they might possibly be active in, both informal groups as well as formal organizations. And the bar that we set was act activity. Were they active in these groups, not just uh, inactive members, uh, but were they uh, you know, direct participants uh, in the groups? And when you add up all the yes answers we got, and we asked actually at the bottom of the 27th option, we asked, do you belong to any other kind of group that we haven't mentioned in this long list that we've already marched you through? And some people answered that yes. And the overall finding was that 75% of Americans of all kinds, Internet users and non-users, uh, are participants and active in groups. 80% of the Internet users are active in groups. And there's a really interesting social media story that is involved in, in group activity, group engagement. 82% of social network site users are active in groups. 85% of Twitter users are active in groups. And one of the consistent things what we found as we began to do multivariate analysis of these data was that those who were most engaged with social media were also most engaged with groups their outcomes, their inputs, uh, and things like that. The average American, internet user and non-user alike, belongs to 3.5 of these types of groups and spends over six hours a week in group activity, usually almost always outside of work. So this is a major element of life for Americans uh, that we were trying to chronicle in this. And just to give you a flavor of the, some of the groups we asked about, we asked about uh, church membership, church activity. 40% of Americans said they were active in their churches. That's the highest single listing for any group uh, activity that we got. 24% are active in consumer groups. 19% are active in community groups. 18% are active in support groups for people who have illnesses or other personal problems that they're trying to cope with. So again, we were looking both at the formal structures of group organization in the country, as well as the kinds of things that Clay and Andrew have been uh, thinking about a lot, which is informal structures, ad hoc groups, do-it-yourself groups, and, and things like that, 
7% uh, of people are part of veterans groups, 6% are, are part of gaming communities, so we're, we're looking at new group formation as well as, as traditional groups. 4% are active in farm organizations. We found that when we looked at groups, uh, there was a striking uh, sort of differentiation that occurred when you looked at different members of different groups. Men and women participate in different kinds of groups. Old people, young people participate in different kinds of groups. Women are more likely than men to be active in church, consumer support groups, parent groups, and things like that. Men are more likely than women to be active in sports groups, veterans groups, and, and gaming communities. Young people are more likely than older people to be part of fan groups, gaming communities, and things like that. Middle-aged Americans are more likely to be part of community groups, political groups, labor unions, and things like that. Older Americans are more likely to be church members, part of charitable organizations like uh, Habitat for, for Humanity, volunteer groups that do services in their communities, professional groups, and veterans groups. When we um, tried to analyze why people belong to groups and what they get out of groups, one of the striking things that emerges in our findings is that people are highly purposeful when they engage with groups. Yes, there's a social dimension. They like to be with people whom they like and who share their interests and things like that, but the key test that most people apply as they're engaging with groups is, does it get the job done? Does it amplify my voice? Does it accomplish the purposes that it want? Does it have good leadership? Does the conversation and, and dialogue and debate that occurs in them uh, have meaning or is it uh, seeming to be frivolous? When we did multivariate analysis, of course, we found that some factors mattered more than others. The new book by Bob Putnam turns out to be confirmed by our data. If you are active in your church, you are much more likely to be active in lots of kinds of group activities, not just spiritual activities, but you're just sort of embedded more in your community and thinking uh, more about community activity. So that's one of the strong predictors of, of group activity. A sense of personal efficacy, which is often tied to socio socioeconomic status. If you've got more education, more income, you think you can influence the world better, and you're much more likely to join with others in groups. Trust matters a lot. If you think other people are worth engaging with and you can accomplish them, uh, something with them, that matters. And uh, the length of time that someone has lived in a community often predicts their group involvement, particularly in, in locality-based groups. But consistent throughout all these data is that technology users, internet users, frequent internet users, those who use social media are more engaged with groups than almost any other characteristic that we've isolated uh, in this data. It's not the case that the internet generally and social media particularly is sort of uh, living up to some of the concerns that people have that they were retreating from life. There are other issues that I hope Andrew will be addressing about what the meaning of this group activity, but it's not the case that they are withdrawing to the artificial worlds of, of virtual life at, at the expense of engagement with their neighbors, engagement with people who, who share uh, their concerns. Uh, they, you know, for, for use of the internet, they are very um, uh, likely to be using websites, exchanging emails and things like that. One of the striking things that we found is that technology is bound up with the fluidity of groups, which is something that, that Clay has talked a lot about. People are joining, leaving, lurking, experiencing groups, and then sampling in a way that if they don't like what they see going on, if they don't like how their engagement has been responded to by others, they will leave groups. And there's a lot of sort of group formation that's occurring thanks to technology as people get invitations, flooding their inboxes uh, on their social networking sites and stuff like that. 57% of people say they get invitations pretty regularly to join groups. 38% say they extend uh, invitations pretty regularly to join groups. So it's, it's sort of part of the rhythms of Internet use are bound up in technology use. Interestingly enough, when we asked people about the impact of the Internet, they were uh, more laudatory about the general societal impact of the Internet than they were in explaining the impact of the Internet on their own personal behavior. They're more likely, there were 68% of the respondents in our survey said the internet was great for communicating with members of groups that they liked, drawing attention to an issue, drew 62% saying that was a major impact of technology on their work. 59% uh, said the internet had a major impact on their, uh, on the, on their ability to uh, focus on society. And uh, one of the, the impacts of the internet that did not show up very high on our list was that only 35% of people said 
that the Internet had a major influence on the leadership and recruitment of leaders uh, for their groups. People were much more discerning about their own impact. They did say that they liked the Internet for the way that it helped them communicate, uh, share their interests, meet people that they wanted, but it didn't really uh, deeply Im impact their capacity to volunteer time or, or things like that. In the case of, um, of social media, um, 46% of, um, uh, of people who um, were involved with, with the, the Internet and, and in active in groups said that they, social media in particular helped them join groups. They could find groups and participate in more groups than would otherwise be the case if technology weren't involved in their life. About a quarter of our respondents said they discovered at least some of the groups that they currently belong to via their searches on the Internet or invitations that came from their friends. And another quarter said that they were allowed, they, the Internet enabled them to spend more time uh, with their groups. That's the end of my data dump, just to, just to, um, to make sure that you're uh, all knowing what's, what, what, what we're going to be talking about. And I thought I'd, I'd start with Jerry because he introduced uh, this whole notion to me. Uh, he and David Johnson were thinking a lot about the sort of historic moment that we're in with group activity in America. It's been such a hallmark of, of national culture. So Jerry, I, I wanted to know how, where you think we now stand compared to sort of the great 18th and 19th century analysis of the role of groups, particularly voluntary groups, not uh, enforced or formal, or formal groups. Uh, you know, let, what's let your notion of where we're placed? As, as um, Having been around probably since, and feel like I've been here since 1836, um, uh, let me approach the question this way. Uh, people on, this, on the stage and in this audience are students of the Internet, uh, members of tech policy uh, companies, scholars, and advocates. We cross a lot of rates, and, and public servants. All of us have, and at least let me speak for myself, pursues liberty and equality and the openness of the internet, not for simply because those are ends in themselves in America, but because of the potential to revitalize and expand and strengthen democracy in America. Today we take these numbers, people are participating in groups, they're using the internet, they're using social media, you take that for granted but we really all have to remember that it just 20 or 30 years ago, there was no Internet. And we, the Internet arises in a time of great centralization of power, both in the media, in corporate power, and government power. And there was no media that allowed citizens to communicate, to organize, to find each other, to build institutions, to create we have not, the internet comes in and offers us that opportunity if it's designed with, the, it has the technology, but does it have the right policy framework? And I've spent my life, and a lot of people here have spent their life working on that policy framework, I think driven by that democratic potential and the, that ultimate open goal. Contrary to the congressman this morning, the internet was not about a cons consumer society, or that these are all consumer devices, but these are creative communication devices which allowed us to organize. And in other rooms in this building, people are talking about ways to take that apart, whether going after intermediate liability or free speech or putting new holes in the privacy protections. Keep that in mind. What we need, if we want to defend an open Internet, we have to establish that it is promoting democracy. And my framework is 1836 and Alexis de Tocqueville. Tocqueville is the greatest student of democracy yet. Came from France and what he found is this equality of condition and democracy was sweeping the world. And what he was concerned about are two extremes. One was rampant individualism where equality would be a great condition but it would divide us from each other and we would be selfish and, and, and as Thoreau would say, leading lives of quiet desperation. On the other side, he said, what saved democracy and liberty was associational life in America. People getting together, communicating, forming alliances, solving problems together, reaching out, and in a very pragmatic way, being effective in their local communities. 
He thought that was the savior of democracy and civilization. And at the core of that, he put newspaper America. Newspapers were decentralized. They were widely available, many newspapers, many pamphlets. And he said that was the engine that drove American democratic civilization because people could communicate with each other. They could reach across distances. They could find common purposes. They could act together. That world of Tocqueville existed in the 1830s. It, without going through all of history, it disappears when, we, when the Internet comes on the stage. It just doesn't exist in terms of communication media. The Internet offers us that inflection point. And what are people doing with the media? They're, while some people are living lives of quiet desperation and social isolation, witness Arizona, there are other people, a large majority, who are using or engaging in group activity, and if they're on the internet, it's more group activity. And it's expanding and if making their, their communication and their group activity more effective. That's a small d message. But I believe that that message, which is shared by a majority of people, is both the life route of democracy and the only way that that, that consciousness will save the open internet that we have today because unless people embrace it in that way and don't want it taken away and see it as a value, the internet could be lost. So the historical point is that we're an inflection point where we have a democratic media. It's a small d message. It ain't, it's what Malcolm Gladwell in New York calls small change. I consider it big change. I was there in the 60s and you could have used the the, the internet for, I, I want to stop there. I think the big message is the small d message that's embedded in the internet. Not the big change, not Wikipedia, and not, you know, what happens with, in Iran, although that's important. We don't have the global numbers here, but that it is playing a healthy, important role in the social fabric of democracy. Thank you. Clay, you've written a lot about um, the differences between then and now. And uh, this survey touches a little bit on, on, on the issues that you've written out, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about why this moment is different and what, what the upside is if, if there is one. Well, I, you know, <clears throat> I want to echo Jerry's comments. I think this moment is different because uh, this is a tool that doesn't just democratize consumption as radio and television did. It also democratizes production and participation. and. Uh, Lee, as I said to you before we sat down, one of the things I love about this report is it really puts some meat on the bones of things that we've been observing, which is that people really are using social tools to change social practices. Um, I, I wanted to, in, in my time, if I could, to pull out, I think, some surprises in the port. One of the things that's beautiful about the work Pew does is they don't just go after top-line questions, but they actually drill down in enough comparative detail that you can start to then ask the next set of questions as well as to, to understand some more granular things about the environment. Um, one of the things that, that, that I think is really interesting about the report is it indicates the, the, the death of two common themes that have been kicked around for years and which are either have always been wrong or, or stopping being wrong. The first of them is the idea of online versus offline, that there is a place called cyberspace that we go to and when we go there we leave the real world. Uh, to me, the single most striking figure in the whole report is that 75 percent of the people who report using the Internet for, uh, in, in their participation in groups did not find those groups using the Internet. What they're doing is they're taking their real-world local community groups and just extending them using these tools. So online and offline are blending in a way that the whole notion of cyberspace sort of under, uh, essentially underplays, and we should, we should take that on board. The second thing... It, dismantles is the idea of geek culture, that somehow the internet is has a native geek culture and that that is being exported by everybody who goes there. Uh, while that effect may be there, it's clearly fairly minor in this report. Number one group, uh, number one kind of group that people are using digital tools to coordinate with are church groups at 40%, church or spiritual groups, sports teams and, sp and sports activities, 24%. Meanwhile, gaming, World of Warcraft, the kinds of things uh, we read about in the geek press, 6%. So in fact, the sort of uh, geek-dominated group participation, while there and uh, greatly engaging to the people who are participating, is not in fact the majority of group activities. Uh, the second thing I think was striking is that when you, 
the, the report lists the kinds of things people think work well about these tools. Communication among the members and communication between the members and society both come out considerably higher than fundraising. So this is continued bad news for the classic NGO model in which you give me some money and I give you a quarterly report and we agree to call that membership, that people are in fact uh, adopting these tools in ways that says they want to use them uh, to deepen social relationships, not just to take new resources on board. And so I think there will be continued pressure if, if, you know, if we see these, these things continue to play out, there will be continued pressure on NGOs to find other ways of involving their members besides this dollars for, uh, essentially dollars for communications trade-off. Um, the third, anytime you get a report like this, you go through combing for digital divides. Uh, they are always there. Which ones they are and how strong they are uh, are interesting. One of the really striking things I think that Pew was turned up is that the two classic digital divides, uh, the divide of educational attainment and the divide of income, show up, but they're not tremendously strong, which is to say even for people who did not complete high school, even for people earning less than $30,000 a year, group participation is still above 50%. So while there is a gradient, it is not uh, a tremendously strong gradient. The really strong gradients are not around participation in groups, but around leadership or creativity. Uh, age, as Lee uh, alluded to in his, in his opening remarks, age and educational attainment do correlate strongly with leadership of those groups. And there's another gradient that shows up over and over again, the common one, which is an age gradient. That although young people and old people all use these tools, young people are far likelier to found groups or to participate in contributing material. And so in as much as there's a digital divide in the social arena, it's less about access to the tools, it's less about provisioning wires and antennas, than it is about permission to use the tools. And if there was going to be work on a digital divide coming out of this report, I think it would be what can we do to increase a sense of permission, a sense of this is actually a desirable use for these tools, which is to say founding and contributing, not just participating, uh, among the people currently uh, not, not involved in those activities. Uh, and finally, because I'm an academic, NYU requires me to end every talk with the uh, job-sustaining assertion that more research is needed. <laughs> so uh, the, the thing that struck me most about the report that I think indicates a possible platform for future research is, again, something that, that Lee alluded to, which is if we do indeed have ridiculously easy group formation, as, to use Seb Peke's felicitous phrase, then we will see lots more groups come into being, which we are seeing, but we will also see lots more groups disappear, and we will see people join and leave groups at lower thresholds of participation. And the, the big open question in, in kind of Bob Putnam's territory is, what does that do to social capital? Because that is less about an anchor of a group of burgers in a town who all know one another. In fact, one of the things that shows up in, report, in the report is that people are more optimistic about using these tools to affect society in the large than they are their local communities, which is to say it's still easier to meet someone who shares your interests and lives far away from you than to meet someone near you who may not share your interests. And so the, the, the effect on... Uh, political participation among people whose ideas differ and, among social, and, and, and on social capital generally uh, is, I think, maybe the most pregnant uh, possible line of research that, that comes out of this report. Thank um, you. And there. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Andrew, things do get broken when disruptions occur, and things do get lost, and that's what you've spent a lot of your time thinking about, and I wonder if you could share your thoughts, not only in the context of this report, but in more generally about, uh, about a world that's changing, uh, not necessarily always for the good. Thank you. Well, I don't want to come across as too conservative. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll start with a couple of points of agreement. I think, I think Clay is, uh, I like to disagree sometimes with Clay, uh, but I think he's really right on two things that he said. Firstly, that um, yeah, firstly, that, um, that the key stat is this 75% uh, Internet users say they use, uh, or 68% of Americans say they use the Internet to c 
to, to, to communicate with members. And I think what Clay has he said this in lots of other areas as well, is this means there no longer is this divide between on and offline. I think that we have to get beyond the notion of the virtual and the real. Mm -hmm. or, you know, these words have become pointless, meaningless. Or, um, the internet is reality. Uh, and even that word itself is you know, slippery. But um, we're living through the digital revolution. And this is the revolution. This is the way in which we're going to live our lives. It doesn't mean we're all going to spend our whole time on the internet. But it does mean that the next revolution, the revolution of the, the knowledge or the information economy, is one that is predicated on this new digital platform. Um, uh, for better or worse, you know, I mean, obviously I disagree sometimes with Clay in terms of whether it is for better or worse, but I think we're both in agreement that it, it's, it's this, <laughs> this, is, this is the reality. Uh, uh, so, so that's w where I would ag agree. Um, but let me go back to what Jerry is saying. I think, I don't know if Clay sort of implicitly agreed with Jerry, and this is where I would disagree uh, Jerry's position, which is a familiar one, which I've been critical of, particularly in Silicon Valley, but generally, is that um, we've had a crisis of democracy in America. That we had this wonderful, we, I'm not even American, but, you know, living in America. Uh, we had the, uh, the, you had this thing called democracy, which was wonderful, it worked really well. Uh, de Tocqueville came here in 1836, he reported on it, it was the envy of the world, and then um, and then it got broken somehow. Um, I think Clay's argument tends to be that we, we stopped participating. This is the traditional, what I would at least describe as a sort of a romanticized uh, communitarian argument that was popularized by Putnam uh, and has been taken up in many different ways by Clay and many other, and Jerry and many other thinkers, saying that we had this crisis in democracy, people weren't participating. And then the internet came along and enabled us to participate. So the internet is a good thing. Uh, what Jerry said is that you had this, and again, I, I don't really understand what he means, this great centralization of power. Uh, if DC is this great centralization of power, then, you know, have you ever been to London or Paris? Uh, I, I don't know what this term Things means. Things could be worse. <laughs> well, it could be considerably worse. You could go to China or Singapore. Um, so this idea, I, I simply reject the idea, firstly, that American democracy has been in crisis. It's a classic argument that came out of the 60s, and I just don't agree with it. I think American democracy works relatively well. I'm not a communitarian, so I don't argue, like Clay or Putnam and all these other people, that somehow the way to fix American quote-unquote democracy is by more community, more organization, more activity. I'm not against those things, but I don't think America is broken in the first place. And American democracy is a representative democracy. As a citizen, you, you're free to choose whether you participate or not. It doesn't necessarily make you a better or worse citizen if you don't participate. Uh, I'd also go back to Jerry's point, and this is where it's interesting. This is where I'm uh, and I also think Clay's right to say you need more research on this stuff. I mean, I think the real questions are how are people joining, why are they joining, and why are they leaving? Uh, Clay's uh, colleague at New York University, um, uh, what's his, the intradivigil, intradividualism, Dalton Connolly, oh, yeah. who's, I think he's the university professor of sociology, has come up with this term intradividualism which is a sort of a shift from the individualism or the strong individualism of the, um, of, the, uh, of the industrial age and suggests that we're just sort of ricocheting from community to community. Sherry Turkle, in a new book, a very interesting new book that I was reading on the plane coming over, called Alone Together, I think, shares, um, shares uh, uh, Connolly's position. I, I tend to be in that camp, although I'm not a, an empirical researcher, so I'm not able to prove this statistically. But I think the point that Jerry brings up is the most interesting one. This, he, he says that um, de Tocqueville saw America in terms of good and evil. The good was the community, the evil was the rampant individualism. And that the community, the activism, the engagement uh, was the thing that maintained democracy against rampant individualism. Now, I agree with Jerry. I think you know, de Tocqueville was a a wonderful thinker, and I think his book is still incredibly rich in terms of 
making sense of American democracy. But what I would say is that the, the strange moment we're in now, and this is what I'm writing a book about, is that we have these two things exaggerated with the Internet. We have this fetish with community, with joining. That's what social media is. That's why Facebook has 650 million members. That's why it has a valuation of 50 billion. That's why it's replacing Google as the center of the Internet. Um, that's why you have Twitter. That's why you have everything that's starting in Silicon Valley is social. If you don't have social as a word 100 times in your business plan, you're not going to get any funding, uh, for better or worse. I mean, it's a reality. It's not just a, a bubble, although it will at some point pop. I'm not quite sure whether Facebook is really worth you know, 50 or $70 billion. But at the same time, and you can't really bl and this is where it gets really complicated but interesting as well, you have what Jerry calls or what the Tocqueville would call increasingly rampant individualism. Now, I don't think the Internet, and I tend to, I've had my moments of de techno-determinism where I blame everything on the Internet, but I think that's a rather uh, vulgar way of thinking about it. The Internet is both a cause and an effect of an increasing rampant individualism. And the reality, in my view, of social media is, yes, there is a, a social element. Even I wouldn't argue that there isn't. But if you look at it more carefully, more analytically, what you see is an increasing rampant individualism. And that's not just a sort of a, a cultural narcissism, although that's part of it. But more importantly, I think we have a shift in the nature of social and economic life so that you have the breakdown of the firm. You have what Daniel Pink calls the emergence of a, uh, a free agent nation. You have all of us on Twitter promoting our own brands, developing our own positions. So I think the reality of the digital world, the digital economy, this great revolution, is of this simultaneous fetish with community, but a, a socioeconomic reality of rampant individualism. And I'm not necessarily using those terms critically. I'm not blaming the Internet. I'm not blaming American democracy. I'm not blaming Verizon. This is a fundamental shift in the nature of economic and social organization as fundamental as the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in the middle of the 19th century. One final point on the research. While I appreciate that Pew is a, an American organization, I'm not sure of the value of studying any of this stuff purely in terms of America. I know that my membership of Twitter or Facebook is by definition, um, by definition international. So the reality, again, of the Internet, for better or worse, is it reflects the internationalization both of identity and of individualism. And the idea that the Internet can come along and strengthen American democracy uh, is illusionary. Maybe it will come along and strengthen global democracy or local democracy. But the idea of uh, the Tocqueville's America emerging because of technology strengthened in the 21st century I think is, is very wishful thinking. Embedded in all of the, the comments that have come before is that you sit at the center of probably the most important and interesting space in this conversation, which is looking at um, government 2.0, how this is changing citizens' relationship to government and government hoping to change its relationship with citizens. Um, talk, act as a century and talk about both sides of that equation, What what is changing now, what isn't changing as quickly as it might be, and, um, and how both sides sort of see this story. Well, I feel uh, terribly inequipped because I don't have a properly plummy accent to give uh, my voice extra authority. Um, but the, uh, the um, and that's not a knock on Andrew, that's simply the way that uh, most of my fellow citizens react to an English accent. We think it uh, means something different. I and could have had a French accent, that, but tend um, to be to talk about, right? And, and perhaps that would have been useful. Uh, you know, certainly he was able to draw a lot of interesting conclusions wandering around uh, Americans and, and talking to them. Uh, decades and decades ago. And, and I think that's one of the uh, historical uh, uh, moments we find ourselves in, where we can all hear one another in ways we just never could before. And increasingly, we can also hear our elected representatives um, and our public officials. And there's an interesting dynamic that's growing out of that, right? The fact that uh, we can share speeches, we can see the videos go online, whether or not the uh, officials want them to be or not. Uh, we can see data that then informs us about different aspects of our civic life that we had before. 
and that the, by the process of sharing that, we actually change the way that we relate to that information, we change the way we relate to one another. Um, this whole concept of strong ties and weak ties, if you're looking at different organizations, is making itself apparent in um, our civic life. Um, and if you look at Pew Internet research from uh, last year, you can see that citizens are turning online in unprecedented numbers uh, for information about policies, for information about laws, for information about their uh, local officials, and uh, increasingly for um, citizen-generated kinds of data. Uh, because the government data isn't always accurate. I mean, uh, as, as much as we'd like it to be, um, huge data stores like data.gov, uh, all the different data stores that are going up um, in different countries and states around the country um, aren't there yet. Um, so we're looking to different organizations to help us with that, whether it's ProPublica um, or other uh, data scrapers, uh, these civic uh, hackers, although you know, hackers are a bad word, civic developers uh, that are um, cropping up around the country. And the, the key thing, I think, in, in what um, Andrew said, uh, and I think there's a lot that's worth reflecting upon there, um, is that uh, it's not a good measure uh, of uh, citizenship uh, in terms of whether you participate or not. And I think we need to consider that a little bit. Because uh, if you have a voice, you can influence your neighbors. If you go out and shovel a walk, you can see the impact that has. If you um, look at how people react to information, there are more opportunities for participation than there ever have, ever have been before. At some point, we've shifted from a place where um, you can just vote a couple times every, you know, every year, or actually, excuse me, a couple times every two years, once every two years. Uh, you can donate, uh, and there's all sorts of issues around uh, free speech and, and money in this town. Um, you can share information, and increasingly you can share skills. There's now an opportunity for uh, distributed organizations to come together using the Internet as a platform um, and actually create things together. And you can see that there's a, a moment where government itself is trying to leverage that. Uh, the White House Open Government Initiative uh, has certainly uh, looked towards that. You can see the, uh, the need for it even more so, though, in the cities and states where the funding is drying up as the stimulus dries out. And the, uh, the possibility for citizens to influence one another to participate in their towns through these networks, I think, is one that has to be deeply considered. Uh, when you see someone saying that I volunteered to do this, that I spent time talking to this person, that I went to this rally, that I watched this video, and they share it through these networks, there is uh, an instant impact. And if it's a certain kind of video, it goes viral. Others, it's more quiet. So there's a long tail in there. But uh, you see videos get watched over and over. And when it comes back to people going online to look for things, there's a particular pertinence to government. Social networks are more adopted in the minority populations of this country that traditionally do not have as much of a voice. Mm -hmm. So if you want to find citizens that um, have not had as much of a, an opportunity to participate in the creation of rules, regulations, in to, uh, to contribute their voices, there's now a, a, a historic moment in those communities. The question is whether they have connectivity. That goes to whether uh, you look at how broadband policy that goes out, whether you uh, consider how cities deal with the digital divide, um, and all the rest of those innovative moments. But uh, the fact is, is that uh, those populations are there in unprecedented numbers. I think the research um, is still evolving to say exactly how government should approach that. Um, but um, the, the, the skew is way off in terms of how many people from those cohorts are there versus, um, frankly, the, a lot of the faces I see in this room. And I think that's something we're going to have to really think about. Um, last thing I'd say is that um, as a, a, a system of rules, there are a number of different ways that the uh, Internet's moving forward. And I think that, um, to, to Jerry Berman's point, about how we think about um, the Internet as a, a platform for voices. Um, the uh, United States itself finds itself in a somewhat of a, a twist at this point. Um, if you're following events out of Tunisia and other parts of the world, um, our policies for our own people are a little bit different than the ones that we're promoting there. <laughs> And that's something that each one of the different government agencies needs to, um, I think, address internally because there's some cognitive dissonance in how those policies go forward. And if you think about tech policy, think about the ways that um, the choke points of the Internet exist, and those are going on in another discussion right now, um, whether it's IP law or, or uh, the, the, the way that uh, information is rooted, 
as we fund circumvention tools in other places, as we think about creating uh, new whistleblower sites for information in government, it's important that you think about um, how those countries, how the citizens there are looking at um, the way we respect our own rules of law, and to consider uh, Commerce Department's uh, protection of our privacy online versus the privacy that uh, different parts of government might seek to infringe upon for different reasons. And uh, I think that the citizens see that in ways they may never have before because they have other options now than going to the broadcast news. They don't need to get it through someone at 6.30. They're hearing it all day long. They're hearing it through their friends. The, the central issue for them, and frankly for our military, is information overload. It's find, finding out what actually uh, the fact is, getting through all that social data, and then understanding through the larger collective wisdom of all that what matters. In other words, fighting that culture of the amateur and getting down to the important stuff. I'll leave it there. Well, Jerry Clay, uh, Andrew sort of teed it up. Rampant individualism and, well, and, and its impact and how it interplays with technology. Here's when I, I've, I, I haven't been called a communitarian for a long time. Um, <laughs> Are you one then? I, I am a theory. I, I, I've studied a lot, and I care about it a lot. But what I was talking about and what I think Tocqueville was talking about and what I see in the Pew study is Americans combining to do things and doing things which they couldn't do alone empowered to do them together in a better way. Now that may be for 12 months, and it may be, you know, if you look on page 23 of the study, I, don't, I know you don't have it, people are stuck doing it for whittling clubs, hobby clubs. I was not making a big P in terms of participation in the political system. I was talking about a whole range of activity, whether it's a, your volunteer group, or your veterans group, or your labor union, people getting together and saying we're more effective, we, we're in groups, which is a very positive thing in America, in a t society that has a huge critique of alienation and, and bowling alone, people are bowling together. And they are doing things and they're being more effective and the net is helping them do that. That is a big story because it is a democratic story. It's not that we are talking to our representatives in Washington, it's that in local communities, and, and, and this is where I'm gonna take you on, Clay, just I have seen in terms of local communities, while the statistics aren't here for that. As people, it, I've worked in several local communities since I've been thrown out of Washington, where, <laughs> I, where people are using the internet to fight a power line, uh, get broadband deployment, uh, demand things from their local government, organize to make it more transparent. They see the technology as bringing them, in, it, it, organizing to be more empowered. Self-interest rightly understood. And I think that that is a, a positive message for a society which talks a lot about and is organized around enormous amounts of fragmentation. Lee, can I? Yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, also extend something that I think Alex was, was talking about, which is the, the, the governmental effect, the, the effect on, on our political system. Uh, we have historically overestimated any place computers are involved. We've historically overestimated access to information and historically underestimated access to one another as the value of the system. The original designers of the Internet said, we're going to make this for getting to files and remote access to machines. Exactly. And for five years, it was a hobby. It was a toy. And then they ported email over, the first killer app. A friend of mine actually calls email the serial killer app because it's never stopped killing. Uh, <laughs> where suddenly the social life that the internet enabled became the first thing that they visibly, the researchers visibly could not live without. And I think there's three reasons, particularly in a governmental context, there's three reasons that, that, that governments will tend to over, overestimate the value of information and underestimate the value of social life. Uh, it's easy, it's familiar, and it's flattering. Uh, if access to information is what matters, then all you need to do is leave a database on the other side of the firewall. Transparency is achieved and politics will improve. Uh, that doesn't actually require any transformation inside the four walls of government, nor does it require rethought engagement with the citizens. Uh, it's familiar, right? We have the, the notion of the couch potato from the media landscape of the 20th century. And so we simply say civic enga civically engaged Citizens are simply couch potatoes who are also policy wonks. 
But in fact, the discussion of and processing of that information in our communities is what matters, not just individual access to, to information. And finally, it flatters anyone who's got access to information that other people don't have to think this is it, that I've got the source code to democracy inside Washington, D.C., and other people need access to it. And what we know from de Tocqueville, whose, whose name has right, rightly been invoked over and over again as the great, uh, the great theorist of this, is that democracy, lowercase d democracy, is what backs up uppercase d democracy. And that when we're looking at these tools, we should expect that access to one another is, in fact, going to be the thing that changes the political landscape. Andrew, uh, Alex raised uh, uh, one of the issues that, um, that you have thought a lot about, which is the shift in influence that occurs as these technologies come in force, not only in groups but in, in, the, in the wider world. And I wonder if you could discuss um, the, the ways in which the shifts in influence don't necessarily end up with better outcomes. Um, I don't know. Could you explain? Well, that more people can sort of drive conversations than people who have credentials or right. institutional okay. affiliations and, and who go through the processes of the institutional yeah. um, institutions require of them. Yeah. Um, this, again, I mean, these are big debates. Um, I, I, by the way, I strongly disagree with Alex's idea that, that this – uh, do you have uh, maybe you've got Pew statistics? Uh, there's always there's always someone who uh, Pew has statistics on everything. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, when I argue with my kids about going to bed, I say, "Well, the Pew <laughs> says this." Uh, but is there Pew evidence that 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 minority? Again, I don't even know what minority. I think everyone in America is a minority these days. But um, that minorities are more active on the internet in terms of political, is, is this a Pew study or is this anecdotal? Where did you get that information okay, from? Okay, so the, um, the study in question was, uh, came out actually last, I think, April. It was one of the first things I had to write about in, in this new job. And what was interesting there, and something actually that has come out more recently, um, minority use, and by minority, let's, let's just say, um, uh, black people and Hispanic uh, populations um, are, they're in uh, greater numbers in social networks. Now, the rub of this Greater is numbers what, than who? Um, than their cohort elsewhere in, uh, let's say, uh, people who look like me. You mean um, like Irish Americans or something? Uh, right. If you, and and, uh, and the, 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 key, the rub of that, and this is something that Clay just spoke to, is what they're doing there. This is very important, and actually the Post just came out with an article about this within the last month, um, is that while there might be there to... Um, engage with one another. The question is whether they're actually sharing information and engaging with um, their government or one another in a civic way as opposed to sharing information about entertainment or um, talking with one another and re reinforcing those ties. And that, that's uh, part of the issue there is whether um, there's uh, Spanish language content or there's outreach into those networks. And if you want to look at, for just uh, your favorite kind of anecdotal evidence, um, go to uh, trending topics on Twitter and explain what some of them are. There are wildly divergent cohorts of people talking there, and they are talking about very different things. And a lot of those things, and you can't figure what the heck is going on, it's those populations talking with one another. Hmm. And uh, it, there, yeah. there's interesting stuff developing there. So I, well, I think this is a very, uh, I won't say something else, but this is a very interesting area because you could argue on, you, you could flip your argument and say that the reason why uh, what you call minorities are so active on networks like Twitter and Facebook is because they're so ineffective. Um, and the reason why more powerful groups in America aren't is because they know for the most part it's a waste of time. It doesn't matter whether something trends on Twitter. So what? I mean, if you want to change things, you, you, know, you get more actively involved in, I don't know, in D.C. or in, in involvement. So, so that, there is another way of thinking about it. And certainly, you know, I'm on Twitter, and you see some of the trending topics are, are, are not ones that seem to reflect any kind of serious political commitment. They tend to reflect... You know, a sort of an adolescent attitude to sex and media. So I'm not convinced by that. But let me say something broader in terms of... Did you want to say something? Yes. Go on in. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is... I'm, I'm back to this weak tie, strong tie. One of the things that, that the Pew study... It's, it, let's be clear. It does not say that people are only participating in groups online. Clay made that point. There's a breakdown between this, you know, we're all in virtual community, which was the early cyberspace vision, which is 
powerful uh, and uh, for the early adopters. But people are engaging in activity online and offline. And one of the interesting things is about the participants who are using the internet and engaging in groups is that a good majority of them are also volunteering mm -hmm. and or um, uh, attending meetings. So they are, they are, their, their group activity is, is, is more than just the click of the mouse. Yeah, but... Which, uh, go on, sorry. Which, so you but, can't say that be, the church group, which is, a, if, if you read Gladwell's article, the churches were incredible, black churches were incredibly important in the civil rights movement, and he argues about strong ties and hierarchy, uh, and the joke of King twittering from a Montgomery jail. But I submit that if, if the civil rights movement had this technology during the civil rights movement, it would not lessen their personal commitment or the fact that they went into a lunch counter, but more of us would have been there with them. Okay, but can I, I want to go into the, the, the question. But let me just come back on that. I mean, you, we can sit here all, all night, all day, all week, all month, all year, and take our positions on what is more influential. I certainly would make the, the, you know, the Obama election argument and... Uh, in, in terms of commitment and serious engagement and argue that, you know, Obama used social media very effectively. I'm an Obama supporter, and I was pleased that he came to power. But I think the, the lack of interest or the lack of success, maybe it's his fault, maybe it's the net roots, maybe it's a combination of him being able to maintain that strong online engagement reflects the way in which people's identity, uh, people's attention spans are incredibly short and that serious political commitment requires uh, much more than just clicking here or there or joining a Facebook. But that's a bigger issue. Just to come back to Lee's point, I think when it comes to democracy, I mean, one of my big arguments is that we're living through this great historical change, this shift from an industrial to a digital world. And along with that change, you know, the, 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 the optimistic narrative, the, the, the Jerry Bermans of the world will argue that that's a good thing, that that reflects a new democratization of society, that technology is enabling that democratization. I would argue that the web is bringing new elites to power. New elites uh, use the work of, say, the Italian sociologist Pareto, who always says that new elites come along and dress up their ideology in democracy. So he certainly wasn't uh, de Tocqueville. Uh, but, you know, we're all part of this new elite. And you see these new, increasingly oligarchical or even monopolistic companies like Google and Facebook dominating the new economy. So, and in terms of the attention and economy and the reputation economy, you only need to go on Twitter to see the way in which 0.05% uh, of the people on the network have more than 15,000 followers, but they're the ones with real influence. I mean, how many, how many followers do you have, Clay? I'm very envious of this. Um, I don't know, 80-something. Yeah, he has 80, because 80, he's, 000, because he's yeah. remarkably influential. But that's the reality of this new world. Clay Shirky has a lot more influence with his 85,000 followers in this attention reputation economy than these sort of self-forming communities that we all might be nostalgic about, but I see very little evidence of. So in my view, the digital world is creating major new inequalities rather than inequalities. And I think one day we're actually going to be rather nostalgic for the industrial age, the mass media <laughs> industrial age. You will laugh where there was a lot more equality than in the digital age. Everybody Let me just say we've got about equally. five more minutes before we're going to have to wrap well, up this party. I'm going to make a, a quick point uh, with regards to the election. I, I think that uh, the, the shiny tools um, that the Obama administration used to get into office are the ones that people frequently cite. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful that uh, he was, uh, he or more specifically his aide was able to tweet um, that they had uh, use of Facebook. I think what's more interesting and it's actually more important with respect to actual getting elected was the use of text and email. Um, and then the use of a simple Web 1.0 tool, which mm -hmm. is allowing people to organize and take donations. Um, that, that's a, that's a, a much more important lesson for elections going forward. Now, the, the landscape has shifted. I think to, 2012 is going to be a different election in terms of the use of this stuff. But one of the things that you can clearly see as a lesson from the past two years in office is that using these kinds of technologies for governance is very different than campaigns. Yeah. What you're asking of the people who follow you 
who are connected to you, who like you, is wholly different than asking them for a vote or a donation. You're asking them to understand the policy, to comment meaningfully upon it, and then follow through on it. Um, now, we, we know the reality of how much time um, people spend doing other things. Um, Clay Shirky down the way here has actually written a book called Cognitive Surplus, looking at uh, you know, people spending 30, what, 30 hours a week watching television. Now, the interesting thing now is that so many people watching television have a laptop or a phone in front of them. So the question is, to what extent can you engage them to do things while they're doing that? If you watch any given sport, sports program, if you watch any given network TV show and then go online, you can see people commenting on it. The question now going forward in government is to what extent are you going to see people commenting and interacting with officials while they're speaking? And then what does that mean for civic participation and policy formation? And I'll, I'll, I'll leave this because I know we have just this amount of time. Today, the Obama administration issued an executive order. You can go to whitehouse.gov and see it. They're actually uh, opening up the gates a little bit on participation in regulatory reform and rulemaking. Now, we'll see what that actually means. E-rulemaking has been a buzzword in D.C. Um, uh, the FCC took uh, comments as a matter of public record on uh, broadband.gov. But this certainly is one more step in the direction of giving citizens the opportunity to participate um, in something that impacts them quite meaningful, which is uh, regulation, and which I know everyone here is uh, pretty interested in. So you got one more shot at yeah, the policymakers and rulemakers yeah, in the room. With, Let's go Jerry, I Clay, I wanna, Andrew, Alex. I want to agree with Andrew, uh, which is the sense that, that um, we are seeing centralization on the net and the potential for uh, – um, Interesting enough, Tocqueville worried about it too. That divided or that out of equality we would choose some benevolent despotism uh, rather than a participatory world out of powerlessness or the desire to be equal or to better the other guy. And we can see that dynamic in our politics and we can see that dynamic on the net. And it's a very big danger about whether people will give up in the name of comfort or nice tools or closed worlds and no spam, uh, choose consumer devices over a, a, uh, the innovative um, uh, uh, Internet. So these are big questions that are opening. And, and I agree with uh, uh, Alex that the, the issue of governing is quite different. The Internet lends itself to, to polarization in terms of uh, promoting single, you know, uh, intense messages. No. Uh, yes, Obama, no Tea Party. The question is how people organize after that. So we don't have the time, but I think that we're, we all are entitled to our own opinions, but not entitled to our own facts. It's really important that this kind of work go on and we get a better baseline for it. Thank you. I'm going to extend that uh, idea to say that, that one of the things I think that hap is happening around the social, uh, building a social environment on top of personal technology is the libertarian the libertarian design ethos of personal technology, the personal computer and so on, uh, has led us to systematically under-design social spaces where hard questions get addressed. Government is essentially a set of rules for losing. Under what, under what conditions will you not get your way and still regard the government as legitimate and still regard the decision as legitimate? Uh, we have, thanks to James Madison, lots of well-designed systems for doing that, uh, as much as people like to complain about them inside D.C. We don't have very many well-designed systems for doing that online. And I think one of the interesting open design questions is, how do you design a space where these political groups, whether local, national, global, can converse in ways that the decision is legitimated even among the people who disagree with it? And right now, the tendency to either rant or opt out uh, prevents the kind of bargaining and horse trading that's actually part of any functioning democratic system. Andrew, a minute. Yeah, I just want to um, uh, just re reiterate, I think, um, this perhaps the disappearance of the, uh, the, the, the Tocquevillian dichotomy between uh, the social and rampant individualism. Mm -hmm. I think Clay put it very nicely when he, what was it, you said that the social was built on top of the personal computer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the reality. For, again, for, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's for better or worse, we've got these two things existing in parallel, seem, seemingly feeding on top, on, 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 they're feeding off one another, this, both the cult of the social 
and the cult of the individual. So the kind of uh, so-called social worlds that are actually appearing are of fragmented individuals. And when you look, when you study individuals, as people like you know Sherry Turkle and, and, and Connolly at NYU have done, what we're seeing is the fragmentation of the traditionally sort of concrete 20th century into individual into this, into this intra-individual who is continually moving, continually in flux. So I think in broad terms, that's the crisis. We have, we, I don't know how you solve it. We can't go back to Tocqueville. Um, but, and, you know, he didn't idealize American democracy either. He realized that it was <laughs> also potentially, you know, not, not as, as ideal as, as he imagined it. Uh, so, so it's this weird symmetry of radical individualism and the cult of the social which will shape this new world, this new digital world that's coming into being and will create all the sort of legislative problems that I think will inevitably go with it. Alex, final word. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Mr. Churchill, um, who's uh, quite a leader in his time, uh, once commented that uh, democracy is the worst form of government ever invented except for all the rest. And, and perhaps we're seeing that the Internet is one of the worst mediums for communication and uh, democratic liberation, except for all of the rest. Um, th that, uh, as Clay points out, the, the, the systems had not uh, been designed and developed so far. The, there are some interesting experiments. If you go to uh, expertnet.wikispaces.com, you can see how the White House is trying to experiment with uh, creating a, a platform for citizen consultation. You can see all the different wikis that are uh, rising right now. It's pretty clear that uh, Wikipedia, uh, after 10 years, has evolved a, to a system where they do actually manage to self-govern around um, this incredible living, breathing um, or organism, uh, you know, online. Um, the the question, I think, for uh, citizens is how much they choose to participate if they see there are actual awards to doing so, um, and the, and how much uh, the politicians who they're elected to serve um, demonize the internet for all the things that they fear about it as opposed to uh, recognize that it's a neutral tool. Uh, th uh, the thing I've seen here in D.C., unfortunately, is that there is sometimes a lack of understanding that these things can go in both directions. The guns can be both used to defend a household and also to take lives. And the Internet can be used to both uh, support and empower citizens in repressive autocracies and also to crunch them by those same autocracies, uh, by tracking them and following them. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that, for instance, Twitter has some problems uh, in terms of uh, supporting revolutions because you can, in, in fact, people do track them down. So um, just to, to be thoughtful about um, the fact that these are incredibly nuanced things and by um, creating uh, policies that uh, change the way that we deal with one another and our, our ability to do so, um, the rest of the world can and will take note. I would like to invite you all to lunch now and, and some wonderful keynotes by Howard Schmidt from the White House and Amoroso from AT&T. And I'd like to thank the panel for a great discussion.